W-I-K-O. Yes. Are we ready to start? Yes, we are. Okay. Are we recording live now, correct? Yes, we are. And we're broadcasting. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good afternoon and welcome to this session of Wilmington City Council's Finance and Economic Development Committee meeting. Um, today is Monday, April 20th. On March 20th, uh, Mayor Michael Brzezicki presented his, his budget for fiscal year 2021. At that point, it becomes council's responsibility to review the budget. Uh, this is our third in a series of budget hearings. Today, we will be hearing from the Department of License and Inspection. And following that one, we will hear from the Department of Real Estate and Housing. I just wanted to acknowledge the council members that are with us today. Uh, President Hanifa Shabazz, First District Council Member Linda Gray, Fourth District Council Member Michelle Harley, Council Member at Large Rashima Dixon, Council Member at Large Ciro Adams. Did I miss anyone? Okay. Um, what I'd like to do is just kind of run through the format that we've been following. Um, we will have a brief presentation by the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, then we will turn it over to the uh, Commissioner of LNI, Mr. Jeff Starkey. Uh, he will make any kind of presentation and then we will jump right into the uh, question and answers. Um, we've set a time limit, 90 minutes uh, for, this, for this budget hearing. I will ask council members to keep all questions to budgetary matters. Any programmatic or constituent issues should be addressed in other forums. If we don't complete all the questions in the timeline that we have, uh, I encourage you to look at the department response or follow up with the department commissioner or with Michelle Bass Knight, our chief of staff, who's also with us today. Um, there will be some time allotted at the end of the hearing for constituent comments. And anyone who would like to speak can raise their hand anytime during the meeting. Um, 
and then they will be recognized in that public comment period. I will ask that they keep their comments to three minutes and that the comments pertain to the budget hearing at hand, which is Department of License Inspection. Um, as we all know, uh, this budget was prepared late last year, early this year, uh, before the uh, pandemic uh, hit us. But uh, we're gonna go through the, the process, uh, but I believe we'll see changes in this budget and we probably will be back in the fall to revisit the budget uh, once we know what kind of losses we've taken in everything. So having said that, at this point, I'm going to turn it off over to the Office of Management Budget. Who is representing them today? I am Mr. Chairman. Excuse me? I am Mr. Chairman Daniel Owens. Daniel, how are you, sir? Okay, okay. Nice to hear from you. You ready to go? Sure, I am. Um, let's start to say uh, good afternoon, Chairman Friel, Madam President, and honorable members of City Council. I would like to thank you for inviting me to present the licenses and inspections. Fiscal year 2021 proposed budget on the budget request on behalf of the Office of Management and Budget. First, let me remind you that further details on the LNI budget can be found in the budget packet as well as in your budget book beginning on page 128. Additionally, I would like to add that the budget details I am presenting here are based on the original proposed budget, which was developed prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Commissioner Starkey will be discussing revisions to some of his budget items during his part of the presentation. With that being said, the LNI department is requesting a total budget of $5.66 million in FY 2021. This total request represents an increase of $98,000 or 1.8%. Funding for the department is derived solely from the general fund. Personal services increased $173,000 or 4.1%. This was mainly due to an increase in regular salaries, which are up $129,000 or 5.2%. The contractual agreement between the city and the Ask Me Local 1102, of which nearly 80% of LNI's employees belong to, provided a $500 increase to each employee's base salary in addition to a 2% cost of living adjustment or COLA. A 2% COLA was also budgeted for all other city employees. Hospitalization costs also increased up nearly $27,000 or 3.5%. MS&E decreased a total of $41,000 or 5.3%. $12,000 was added to furniture, fixtures, and office equipment to provide more ergonomic chairs and desks to the LNI staff. However, this increase was more than offset by decreases to demolition and hazardous cleanup costs. To more properly align with the historical actuals, demolition costs are now budgeted at $350,000, a $50,000 decrease, while hazardous cleanup is budgeted at $15,000, a $15,000 decrease. Internal services increased by $16,000. This was primarily due to an additional vehicle being added to the LNI fleet for the zoning enforcement officer at a cost of $15,000. The animal control account line, which consists of money transmitted to the state of Delaware for animal control services, decre decreased $51,000 or 16.6% to reflect the actual contractual costs. This concludes my presentation of the 2021 proposed budget request for the LNI department. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I do wanna make one clarification. Uh, there will be a public comment period at the end of each hearing. So at the end of LNI, we'll have a public comment period. And then again, at the end of real estate and housing, we'll have a separate public comment period. 
All right, at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over. I also want to mention that we are joined by the, uh, the Chief of Staff for Mayor Brzezicki, Tanny Washington. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to the Commissioner of, uh, of License and Inspection, Mr. Jeff Starkey. Jeff, did you unmute your uh, button? We can't can you hear me? You. Can you hear me now? Me now. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Before I start, I'd just like to add I'm having some low bandwidth, so I'm popping in and out. So if you, if, if I pop out, uh, that's the reason. Uh, I just want to thank you, Councilman Frill, and members of City Council, for for providing us the opportunity to present our 2021 budget. First, our prayers go out to anyone who may be experiencing the negative impact of coronavirus. Secondly, I want, I want to thank our staff for continuing to provide LNI services to our constituents. We are being challenged every single day while we navigate through this crisis. Our staff has stayed the course as their daily activities and processes have changed. For that, I'm thankful. Now we are prepared to start the presentation. Okay, sir. Uh, our vision, Department License Inspection strives to promote and protect a safe living and working environment for all citizens of the city of Wilmington. This is achieved by implementation of fair and unbiased, unbiased Wilmington city codes. Our goal is to facilitate voluntary compliance by working in partnership with our constituents. Together, we can successfully achieve a prosperous future for our city. Uh, Department of Pro Priorities for this year, um, and this was some of this was prior to coronavirus, schedule and complete 2,000 rental inspections, uh, continue to explore converting housing violations to cr criminal from criminal to civil penalties, and identify non-licensed rental property owners. A performance measure, respond to all constituent complaints within 48 hours of receipt, uh, inspectors compliance rates for inspectors, and track and identify non-rental license owners. Okay, you ready to get ready for the questions, Mr. Starkey? Ready to go. Okay, uh, discuss the budgetary account lines that could potentially be impacted as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, obviously since this occurred, uh, we'll be purchasing a lot more PPEs, which is personal protective equipment. Uh, that's one of the line items. Obviously, it's going to go up when we get back to normal. And as we're continuing to work through this process now, uh, we anticipate potentially our overtime going up as well. Uh, and our consultant line item uh, is going to go up potentially. Why do you feel the consultant line will go up? Well, as you can see, we're, we're anticipating deleting the vacant uh, plans examiner position. Uh, and right now that would leave us with one. So we would bring a consultant in periodically to, to assist us to reviewing uh, construction plans. Okay. Um, well, you might've answered this question then. Uh, discuss any current vacant positions, duration of vacancy, timeline for filling the position. Well, our plans examiner position has been vacant since 2012, 2000, I mean, February, two, February 12th, 2020, I'm sorry. Uh, we also had a retirement of our, our existing plans examiner, which was in November of 2019. So we've been short on plans examiners in the last, I would probably say year or so. The uh, discuss any proposed changes to positions, the new positions, deleted upgrades, downgrades. We currently have none. What we just discussed. Um, discuss the 500,000 budget between the property maintenance and demolition account lines. Uh, we have performed demolitions and various structural st stabilizations on properties that could potentially lead to demolitions if the owners don't rectify the conditions. We continue to monitor those properties and reserve funding for that work. Uh, anticipated demos, uh, 903, 905 Kirkwood Street. We stabilized those. They could lead to demolition. 734 East 6th Street. Uh, we stabilized that one as well. Could lead to potential demolition. 1016 West 3rd. Uh, and again, uh, we stabilized the property. It could lead to demolition. And just Thursday of last week, we had a major fire at 109 West 26, 
which we're in the process of demolishing now, which is a major, major project. Uh, we typically don't uh, use up all of our demolition. We try to get through the winter uh, and try to work, start working on it around uh, April or so, uh, just to make sure we get through the winter and we have enough funding available to do demolition. But we've had two in the last couple of days, have 109 West 26, major warehouse, church, fire. Uh, it's gonna cost us up, up where probably in the $90,000 range. Uh, we have one Sunday, uh, Council President Anifa Cervantes is aware of this one, 1126 B Street, which we're in the process of demolition, dem demolishing now, uh, starting tomorrow, which is gonna cost us about 45,000. So those two in the last week, uh, things can change very rapidly. Ant anticipated property maintenance issues, based on our property maintenance budget, or, or historical data re is received from inspectors field inspections. However, it's done on a case by case basis. Although it was mentioned in the question that we've only spent 31,000, uh, that's actually incorrect. Uh, we had a carryover PO, which allowed us to use some of that money as well. So we're up in the range of probably about 50, 59,000 now on property man maintenance alone. Uh, we haven't received invoices since for, for February and March. So he's got a, a ton of invoices to get in uh, to, to be paid. So we're trending pretty close, probably a little lower than what we did last year. Just, just because we've had a, a calm winter, uh, but that's where we are with those two line items. Next slide, you'll see, uh, that's the picture of the fire that was ha that happened Thursday. Uh, it was a major fire, the building's totally destroyed. Property owner has no funding, so we'll end up, actually, we've actually torn it down. So it's already down now. Uh, so we, we gotta foot that bill and actually build the owner for that. The three that you're looking at on the next slide, Kirkwood Street, we stabilized. That's the 903, 905 Kirkwood. Uh, the owner hasn't done that since we stabilized it. The one in the middle is uh, East 6th Street. It's been stabilized. That's a three-story building. And the one to your far right is 1000 block of West 3rd Street. That owner has no funding as well. Uh, it could potentially lead to a demolition as well. Okay. Um, discuss the 265,000 allocated for animal control by the number of animals retrieved compared with the same time last year? Uh, animal control is actually housed in here and it's a state contract. Uh, we basically get the numbers from the, from the uh, animal control office, uh, which is displayed on the, on the screen. All right, so in the fiscal year 2018, there were 618 animals retrieved. This year, 851, so a jump of over 200. Right, and they, they go by quarters, by calendar year. Right. Okay, um, discuss the planned use of 68,000 budgeted memberships, registration, and the wearing and apparel account groupings. Well, employee certification and CEUs, which is continuing education units, uh, training as per union contract for our employees that hold certifications, all require resource books and materials for inspectors to perform their, their job tasks and provide no necessary safety equipment for employees as per union contract, which obviously we're in a coronavirus, so we're gonna up that as well. The employee certification, uh, has any of that been put on hold because of, uh, of the uh, virus and not, people not getting together as, as far as it being done more through Zoom meetings, things like that, you know? Well, we had actually scheduling two of them by the end of the year, but most likely they'll be canceled. So uh, it'll probably run into whenever we're released to do you know, gatherings. I'm not so sure they're doing the Zoom as of yet, the ICC organization that we use. But we're looking into that as well. When you say the end of the year, you refer to the fiscal year or the calendar year? Fiscal year. We usually schedule one in May and June. Gotcha. Okay. Um, discuss the planned use of 50000 budgeted for professional fees. Well, as I mentioned, we have several different consultants as, that we use. Uh, the structural engineer who conduct assessments of structural issues, issues including property slated for demolition. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our plan review consultant due to vacancy and retirements. Uh, we bring in periodically a roof consultant to assist us uh, when we have a question with roof. 
as well as a tree consultant. And then also in that line item is our GPS tracking for our vehicles. If why would you need to bring in a, a tree consultant? Uh, wouldn't that be handled by uh, uh, the individual in uh, public works? He, he can never facilitate the, 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 the amount of uh, tree requests that we get. I mean, he's so busy with the trees that he's dealing with. Uh, we were usually put on the back burner, to be very honest. And he deals primarily with the public trees. We're dealing with private property trees, more issues. Uh, he just can't get to our stuff in most cases. Discuss the 50,000 budgeted for overtime, uh, specified process for checking permits for weekends and evening hours. Our overtime is primarily used for the emergency on-call person, which we have a person on 24 hour call after 4.30 uh, and also accommodate staffing for our LNI review board. Uh, right now there is no funding in there for any weekends or permit or evening checks. So anyone that complains about work going on a weekend, uh, you really can't visit that issue until Monday morning. That's correct. That's correct. Discuss the budgetary request for an additional new motor vehicle to be added to the city's fleet. Well, as you know, we added a zoning enforcement officer, uh, but we're, one, we're short one vehicle for that person. Uh, so that vehicle will be critical for him to do his following up on zoning related issues. Uh, he started around October, August or October, I think somewhere around there. Uh, so he's on board now, uh, but we don't have a vehicle for him to use at, at this point. Is an item like that potentially going to be cut because of the, uh, because of the financial crisis we're going to find ourselves in or we're already in due to the virus? Well, I mean, I, I have to meet with the chief of staff in the mayor's office just to, you know, I'm sure we're going to go back and look at all the budgets right now. Uh, some of this was put together prior to Corona. Okay. Um, uh, the last question is the same for all departments. It's the, uh, it's the org chart that council members can review at their leisure. Um, were there any questions from council members? Right now, right now, the org chart has in there 43, but we, we're recommended to delete that one position, so it would actually be 42. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh, okay, uh, we'll go ahead and start. Uh, we've been joined, which I didn't realize, with my council member, uh, Chris Johnson, and we'll go ahead and start with him with the first question. Mr. Johnson. Thank you very much, Chairman Friel. Yes, yes, I'm up. Okay. Um, just in regard to the, the, the vacant property demo line, um, has L and I uh, gone into or researched um, using clear boarding at all for vacant properties instead of the standard wood boarding? Uh, we looked at that some years ago, but we haven't looked at it recently. Okay. Um, is that something that the LNI could possibly pursue down the line? Because um, it's my understanding that you know the, the technology has advanced within the past few years, maybe making it a little bit more cost effective. Certainly, we can look at it. I mean, we, we'll look at any new technology, uh, but you know, we'll take a look at it as well. Okay, and uh, Chairman, I have a follow-up question. Sure. Um, just in regard to the budget line for aggressive code enforcement, um, it's uh, budget line uh, 101-210. Um, what does that entail? Is that is that this inspector time? Is that extra overtime that's included in that? Because I, I did notice the line is um, you know fairly substantial. It's about 350,000. So is that an all encompassing budget line? That's primarily used for demolition of buildings. Okay. Okay, so it's not code enforcement as much, but but it's demo work. This demo work, as I mentioned, uh, we had a fire on <coughs> last week. That's going to cost us about nine ninety five thousand. Okay. All right. I have, I have no further questions, Chairman. Thank you. Hey, Council Member uh, Gray.
Councilman, Councilman Gray. I just have two questions. I'd like to know why there was a decrease in the animal control money if you picked up more animals this year than last year, or was that the state that picked up more animals? It's my understanding that the county chipped in their portion of it and that decreased our, our total bill for animal control, but I'll have to confirm that. Okay, <clears throat> okay, thank you. And one more, um, has anything been considered or are people thinking about how to, what, sanitize an apartment? If you know someone has had the virus and they've moved out of the apartment, there should be a two week, 14 day, um, you know, exposure from someone moving in or using that apartment? Has Ellen and I thought about that? Or do you think the landlords are aware of that? No, we haven't had those conversations yet, but I'm sure once this is all over, we'll be having a lot of conversation on, on how we deal with, you know, inspections, yeah. condition of properties and so forth. Thank you, because the only reason I brought that up is there's um, evidence that it lives 14 days on hard surfaces. So someone unfortunately had the virus and moved out. I was just concerned about the next person moving in, but thank you. Understood. Council Member Dixon. Um, thank you, um, Chairman Farrell. Um, I had two questions, um, maybe three. I think I got two and one. Um, so one is uh, for, I saw for the furniture line that there's an increase of $12,000. Will that be considered to be cut due to, um, since it's a non-essential? Uh, actually, I, I would prefer that not because because some of these folks are sitting in chairs that are or, or not, you know, in good condition. So if no, in order for them to really fulfill their tasks and to do their jobs, they need to be sitting in something uh, worthy of sitting in. Otherwise, you know, we may have some medical issues with it. I mean, some of them are for ergonomic chairs, and that's the purpose of it. Is there, uh, is, and just to follow up to that, is there a way to um, either find refurbished or something that's uh, at, a, at a cheaper price in order to um, still accommodate that need? Um, not sure. I haven't looked that far into it. I mean, some of these chairs are probably 15 years old. They haven't been replaced in so long. So uh, we really need to look at you know, providing them the necessary tools to do their jobs. Okay. Um, and then my next question would be, I saw that in a, uh, and it kind of go off of the, the demolition uh, conversation I've already started. Um, one, um, so I understand why there's an increase in it, but um, I also saw that for each year prior, um, the numbers are not um, equaling up to as much as was budgeted for. Is there a reason why are you being replenished for some of those funds or um, are they just not being used? Well, everything that we do, you know, demolition wise and property maintenance wise, we, we build a property owner. So in some cases we get, you know, replenish those funds. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's somewhat difficult sometimes to anticipate what's going to fall, what needs to fall. Uh, we try to be cautious with that as, as much as possible. So uh, we wasn't anticipating the two fire that, or the fire we had the other day or the structural wall that's falling. So uh, that just happened. And, and it happens like that sometimes. Yeah. Um, and then just a, a last follow up to that. Um, how often are we picking up the tab for people who cannot afford to pay for their demolition? If it deals with any safety issues, we do it. We have to do it. You can't leave it in an unsafe uh, condition. Uh, the fire that happened Thursday, the roof was hanging off. We had to go in there and do something with it because uh, kids are playing around there a lot. So uh, we make sure that it's, it's code compliant when we leave. Uh, and then like, like, as I mentioned before, we send them a bill for that work. And how much are, do you, I mean, you may not know this offhand, but how much are we picking up the tab? I guess I'm just trying to number wise, know how much we're, we're picking up um, if they're unable to pay for it. Well, every property maintenance one we do, we pick up the tab until, unless they pay us and we send them a bill for it. Same thing with the demolition. Uh, they can't afford to do it. And it's a safety issue. We take care of the issue. Is there, um, my last follow, is there a way for us just to get some uh, a range or just a number of how much um, it's costing us to do that? Well, if you, if you look at the expenditures, that'll tell you what we spent. Uh, we were not going to do it if they could afford to do it. So if we spend the money, then we're picking up the tab for it initially anyway. I, I, think, what she's asking, I think what she's asking, Jeff, do we ever recoup 
any of the any of that money that we use a demolition line or yeah. is it pretty much to the point where we end up taking them to sheriff sale or something like that well rarely rarely we do we recoup every now and then we, we may recoup some of it uh but you got to realize if we spend thirty forty thousand dollars on demolition by the time we're done the lot's probably worth two thousand uh, dollars so in most cases we have to take it to sheriff's sale to recover anything from it. Thank you. But I could go back and, and see if we recovered any any funds from either demolition or property maintenance. Thank you, we appreciate that. Uh, Council Member Harley. Yes, thank you, Council Member Friel. Um, Commissioner Stark, you have a couple of questions. Um, one, uh, you mentioned the property on being healed. So what exactly happened over there? Uh, received a call on Saturday that the wall was collapsing. Uh, so we in turn went over, we have our contract over there, hopefully to start tomorrow. Looks like it potentially could collapse. So we're trying to rectify the issue before it collapse. Okay. Uh, Council member Adams. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chairman Friel. Uh, Director Starkey, nice to see you, sir. Thank you. Uh, um, Councilman Friel. Um, I could, uh, we got cut off. Oh, for sure, for sure. Just yes. Can you hear me? Councilman Friel? I hear you. Yeah, so, um, Commissioner. Um, um, WITN? I, I oh, hear you. Go ahead, Michelle. Yes, Marshall. WITN, can you hear can me? You hear? Yes. Okay. okay, all right. I'm gonna have to put you on hold for one minute to stop the meet, just on hold for one minute because the Zoom start stopped on Bud's PC, so give me give us about ten minutes. Okay, sure. No, we can still see you, Bud. You can't see, or you can't see the television. Okay, okay so I didn't hear Commissioner Starkey's response. It went out. The next thing I, I knew, I heard Councilman Adams. So I wanted to hear what Commissioner Please, Stark said. Can we just hold the meeting for a minute? The chair is not on. Please. Thank you.
WITN? Yes. Okay, so we're, we're testing because we have our Zoom technology had just, um, the video had completely went blank. So we're back up and online. So we just testing. I'll we'll be writing one minute. All right. Mm -hmm. WIT and we're ready to, to, um, to resume. Okay. okay. Yes, I believe it's leaving off with Councilwoman. Hello? Hello. Yes, uh, Councilman, Councilman I Friel. Apologize. I apologize for the interruption. We were having some technical difficulties up here. I believe uh, Councilmember Harley was asking a question. Yes, thank you. So yes, I was um, asking Commissioner Starkey uh, what happened on B and Hill Street. And that's where we left off. That's the last place where I left off. All right, Mr. Starkey, you still with us? Yeah, can you hear me? I yes. can now, yes. yes. Yes, so we received a call from uh, Council President Anifa Shabazz on Saturday that she received a complaint from someone that says that the building was uh, in fear of collapsing. So we immediately sent someone over to take a look at it. And uh, in fact, the roof is now compromised. So we had all the cars removed uh, and had a barricade and in the process of demolishing, hopefully starting tomorrow, because uh, the roof is completely gone and the walls are pushing out. Okay, so. Did you have another question, Council Member Harley? She, she's it. She, we lost her again. Councilmember Harley, are you still with us? Commissioner? Yes, we, yes. we lost okay. you. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. I hear you now. Yes, so who will who gets the bill for that? The property owner gets billed for it. Okay, all right. So um, I guess we can talk about this offline um, because I think there's an opportunity throughout the city Hello? She keeps, she keeps going in and out. I'm sorry, Ms. Harley, we keep losing you. And there may be an opportunity for us to put a policy in place that even if your property is paid off, you know, maybe there, you know, they can be required to still have whole, you know, property insurance. You for the vacant property? Yes, sir. Yes, like I said, we can talk about it offline. I just know that they're they're in. She's losing her. All right, Ms. Harley, you keep uh, Councilman Harley, you keep going in and out, so we're going to kind of move on. It's okay, and you can discuss this issue with uh, the commissioner further. Could talk about it on offline. Yeah, definitely. But thanks for that information because I seen that incident on uh, social media. I couldn't tell if it was a fire or what was going on. So thank you for that um, update. And then my second question real quick is that you said that um, we're going to be getting uh, PPEs in. And I guess my question is, is the city going to be given out um, masks or, you know, do you know anything about that? I know the chief of staff is on this call. I've been getting calls about it and I just wanted to know if we're going to be giving them out. 
I'm, the ones I'm referring to are just for our employees that are doing inspections. Okay. Um, is the chief of staff still on the line? Yes, I'm here. Hi, how are you Hi. doing? Yeah. I'm, uh, are you speaking of the general public? Yes, I mean, are you aware of um, any any initiatives that we are doing to to provide masks? It's just a question. Yes, yeah, so um, that question has come before the COVID working group. So they're working on something, getting masks out to the general public. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have, Councilman Friel. Thank you. Uh, before I went out, I zoomed out, I believe Councilmember Adams had a question. Did you ever get to ask your question? Uh, actually, uh, thank you, Chairman Friel. Uh, yes, uh, um, <clears throat> I gave way to uh, uh, Council Lady Harley so she could finish her uh, questions. Yes. With that, right. I, I have two uh, unrelated questions for uh, Commissioner Stark. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Stark, uh, with regard to uh, rental inspections, how many rental inspections did you do last year and how many will you do in the coming fiscal year? Uh, I don't have the number from me, but somewhere I think, if I recall correctly, we were in the 1700 range, uh, but I'll confirm that with you. Uh, our goal for this year was to do 2000. Oh, super, super good, good. Glad to hear that. And uh, hey, hopefully we'll keep that number going up where the, each year. Uh, the other unrelated question, with regard to the demolitions uh, of these properties, I know you had four on the screen here or whatever. Um, <clears throat> how long from the time when you finished the demolition to those properties are transferred into the land bank? Uh, uh, you know, in other words, uh, how long does the city actually have a hold on that? Uh, I know there were many questions asked about the cost of that, but uh, I would just like to know uh, how long from the time you uh, demolished the building to its uh, transition into the land bank. Well, keep in mind, when we get involved, we don't own the property. So we're demolishing them and then we have to put a lien on them or send them a bill. Uh, then we would have to take it to sheriff's in order to take ownership of it. So uh, the time frame, I'm not exactly sure how long that will take. Uh, but it can take up to a year or so, depends on the circumstance. Uh, but again, we don't own them. So we're just demolishing them just to rectify the safety issue. And then we have to put a lien on the property. Okay, so these properties that you had listed on your budget then were, uh, were private properties uh, where I guess uh, uh, the uh, condition of the building was so poor that they needed to be demolished. And then you subscribe. That's correct. And they're all. Uh, okay. Yeah, they're all privately owned. So. Got it. Uh, you know, they're privately owned, and they own. They're privately owned, and the owners aren't responding to our, our notices, or in the case of an emergency, uh, we emergency demolish it. Uh, uh, certainly, and then understood if there was a major fire that that would be an emergency. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, Director Starkey, I, I believe I asked you the same question last year, and I apologize for that. Thank you. Hey, guy, you, you have a good day. I'm done, uh, Chairman Friel. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Uh, President Shabazz? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner, can you share with everyone, I mean, the... In Go ahead. All right. Um it won't let me. Okay, there it is. You got to meet me. Um, could you share with everyone the, the, the variance of cost of a demolition? I know that sometimes it could be, I know you said 40,000, but I've also known there's a, um, that no, there's also a time when a demolition could cost maybe six, 50 to 50, 60,000 dollars. I just, just, trying, just for information purpose so that people can understand the cost of demolitions. Well, right now we're getting prices for two stories. Probably depends on if there are two walls versus one wall, between 35 and 45,000. To get up to three stories, you're probably 45 to 60,000. Okay. Uh, and the one that we had the other day, which was unusual, which was the warehouse, uh, that's going to be up in the range of 80 to 90,000. Okay. Um, thank you. And you usually do. Uh, we don't we don't do that in-house we commission or contract someone out to do that correct 
That's, that's correct. Uh, we try to, we usually bid them out. Uh, we try to get three quotes when it's not a non-emergency. Uh, and if it's emergency, then we just call who's available at that time to get it done. Which is why we have to have some money on hand to do so if we have an emergency demolition. Absolutely. Okay. Um, also, when you mentioned too about the increase of animals that you, um, that, that the, um, you were able to exterminate, was any of them raccoons? Or were they, oh, that all uh, pest was that all just the cats and dogs from the pest control um, division of the state? Well, I think the, the animal control is, is mainly for the dogs. Uh, we generally do pest control out of another line item periodically. Okay. Uh, we don't have a specific line item for that. So uh, we just try to pick it up occasionally every now and then when we get a chance to do it. That's not what he said. I can't move it around. But, th but that was that was not the reason for the increase of number of animals because you did any any any, any amount of raccoons that Councilwoman Oliver has in her district. No, that's not even listed in there. Okay. Thank you. That's that's all I have. Hey, uh, I don't see any other questions from council members. No, my hand is up. Raise hand. Not showing up here. Right, uh, Member Oliver. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes I can. Oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, no, I, I want to um, clarify that. Um, it had a gentleman come out and a private contractor and he was able to catch a raccoon and that was from public works. So maybe, Okay. Um, so they caught quite a few of raccoons on the north side of town. I went out there and met with him. Um, and like I said, I, I met with, that was from public works, but um, even with even with uh, LA9, they were able to come out and catch some possums, not raccoons, but Public Works was able to catch some um, raccoons. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, not seeing any other questions from council members, I'm going to open it up. Uh, if anyone from the public would like to make comment uh, in regards to the budget for Department of License Inspection, you raise your hand at this time. Not seeing any hands raised. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and conclude this hearing with the Department of License Inspection. We're gonna take a little break and we will be back at 5.30 with the Department of Real Estate and Housing. Uh, I thank you all for your attendance and participation. Thank you. Thank you, thanks everyone. Thank you, sir.
Hello.
Who do we have here? Can you read the hand for me? Mm -hmm. Hang on one second. Go ahead. We have an attendance. Uh, good evening and welcome back to this session of Wilmington City Council's Finance and Economic Development Committee. Uh, we are in the middle of budget hearings for Monday, April 20th. Um, we just heard from the Department of License and Inspection and now we're going to hear from the Department of Real Estate and Housing. Uh, my name is Bud Friel. I'll be chairing the meeting. I just want to acknowledge the other council members that are joining us. Uh, President Hanifa Shabazz, First District Council Member Linda Gray, Seventh District Council Member Chris Johnson, Fourth District Council Member Michelle Harley, Sixth District Council Member Il <coughs> excuse me, Londa McCoy, and at large members Shiro Adams and Rashima Dixon. Um, we are reviewing Mayor Michael Brzezinski's fiscal year 2021 budget. Uh, we're going to follow the same format that we had uh, followed earlier. We're going to have a brief presentation from OMB, and then we're going to turn it over to the uh, Director of Real Estate and Housing, Mr. Bob Weir, for any presentations, and then we're going to get into questions and answer. Okay. One slight change. I had uh, uh, one colleague ask if we could do question number eight first, which deals with the uh, CDBG budget. So we will do that, and then we'll go back to the regular order. Uh, there is a time limit of 90 minutes on this budget hearing. I'm asking all council members to keep questions to budgetary matters. Any programmatic or constituent issues should be addressed in other forms. Any questions that we don't complete, uh, council members can follow up with staff or the department director. There will be a period at the end for public comment. Um, constituents will have three minutes to, uh, to make comment uh, based on the Department of Real Estate and Housing budget. You can raise your hand anytime during the meeting, but you will be acknowledged during the comment period. Okay, so at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to the Office of Management and Budget, who's with us this afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Braille. Good afternoon. Okay, so good afternoon, Chairman Braille, President Shabazz, and honorable members of council. Before I begin, I would like to note that the following budget was finalized before the COVID-19 crisis began. I will be presenting the budget as it was originally proposed. However, Director Weir will be discussing any potential modifications to the budget as a result of the coronavirus. That being said, uh, the Department of Real Estate and Housing is requesting a total general fund budget of about $3 million. Of that amount, $2.3 million is in the administrative division and $700,000 is in the rehabilitation division. Overall, the general fund budget increased by about $1.1 million or 61% over FY 2020. Personal services increased by about $120,000 or 74%. This reflects the transfer of 1.27 FTEs from, uh, to the general fund from the Community Development Block Grant or CDBG fund. This is because per federal regulations, no more than 20% of CDBG funded activities may be administrative in nature. Therefore, any amounts paid from the CDBG fund that exceed this administrative cap must be charged back to the city's general fund. Over the last four fiscal years, an average of $111,000 has been charged back to the general fund each year. 
so to, in order to avoid this unbudgeted expense to the general fund, address prior year audit findings and properly comply with federal regulations, the Department of Real Estate and Housing is thus reallocating FDEs to the general fund. ms &E increased by a little over $1 million or 129%. This is largely due to a budgeted $1 million grant to the Wilmington Neighborhood Conservancy Land Bank per a 2016 MOU between the city and the land bank. In addition, consultants increased by $83,000 to fund a consultant to coordinate the department's home ownership program while also serving as a liaison to the land bank. Funding for this consultant was previously housed by the CDBG fund but is being moved to the general fund to comply with the 20% administrative cap. Finally, debt service decreased by $109,000 due to a reduction in costs associated with a projected debt refinancing. This concludes my presentation and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I wanted to uh, mention we've been joined by Council Member Santhi Oliver for the third district. Um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Mr. Bob Weir, the uh, Director of Real Estate and Housing, for any opening remarks prior to us jumping into the question and answers. Mr. Weir. Thank you, Chairman Friel. Uh, thank you to City Council Committee uh, for the opportunity to present the 2021 FY budget for the Real Estate and Housing Department. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the staff of the Real Estate and Housing Department for the hard work that they have uh, put in this year and, and we anticipate they'll put in uh, in the coming year. As far as the vision of the Department of Real Estate and Housing is, is to improve the quality of life for the residents of the City of Wilmington by increasing the supply of affordable housing, improving housing markets, and the existing housing stock by promoting self-sufficiency and engaging in activities to stabilize and revitalize neighborhoods. Thank you. Uh, the, our three really top priorities are to increase the supply of affordable housing that is decent, safe, and sanitary. Uh, engage in activities geared towards stabilization and revitalization of neighborhoods and increase homeownership opportunities through city-sponsored initiatives and collaborative efforts with nonprofit and for-profit developers. Uh, we are looking at uh, the coming year as far as uh, our top performance measures are to administer and or fund housing programs to preserve existing occupied housing. Um, that is primarily uh, owner occupied uh, properties that uh, we can take federal funds and help them either rehab or facade improvements. Increase the availability of affordable homeownership units. Uh, that is partnering with our nonprofit partners in the community, but also uh, it includes using federal funds and actually doing homeownership uh, production in-house, so affordable homeownership. And we also have a um, focus on down payment settlement assistance. Uh, partnering with the Delaware State Housing Authority, we believe that we can do over 65 units uh, through a down payment settlement assistance program this coming year. And we're also looking to support organizations that provide services to Wilmington's most needy residents. Okay, um, like I said, we're gonna jump to the end and uh, do question eight first. Uh, discuss the plan use of the approximate 3.7 million budgeted across community development block grants. And I'll be honest, I cannot remember all the acronyms for the uh, the other uh, funds. The, the well, the uh, home uh, folk, the home dollars, the C, the ESG is emergency shelter grant, and the HOP was housing for for people with AIDS. Thank you. So, as far as uh, under care funds, uh, the city was just recently awarded uh, the, the amounts that you're uh, seeing here, the CDBG for FY20 at 1.3 million. Uh, emergency service grant in year 20 for $647,000 and HOPWA for year 20 at $117,000. Uh, when we look at that, uh, this is, I heard this used by a number of consultants and folks that work for HUD. This is kind of like uh, we are flying an airplane and building at the same time. I uh, attended a hour and a half uh, webinar this afternoon where HUD was actually rolling out the uh, rules and regulations for these care for these care dollars 
as uh, as we spoke this afternoon. So their, their rules and regs are coming out um, as quickly as possible, but certainly the money was awarded before the rules and regs are put in place. Um, as far as the regulations that we're going to adhere to, uh, they are still in a fluid state. Uh, we are working with the COVID-19 work group. Uh, we have a meeting tomorrow scheduled with our HUD consultant uh, to make sure that uh, we know every possible way that we can address community needs with these dollars. And uh, then we look at uh, having it, feedback really from uh, the mayor's office, from members of the community, from members of city council, uh, from the organizations that we're currently under contract that are providing services in the community. The one thing that is clear with these care dollars is that they must address individuals that are affected by the COVID-19. Uh, so that when we talk about federal funds, we talk about uh, you know the admin caps and things like that. They're constantly moving at this point, but uh, we are looking to take those dollars and really be a conduit to organizations in our community that can deliver services, deliver supplies uh, as quickly and efficiently as possible. As far as the actual budget dollars that we've been given, uh, once again, we adhere to the federal regulation, regulations regarding the criteria and selection of organizations and projects. Uh, they're followed in uh, this pre presentation in a detailed manner. Uh, what basically happened in that process is that, one, it, the funds were advertised not only to all the folks that had previously been recipients, but through the uh, social media and also through um, a widely distributed local uh, newspaper. And uh, once we did that, and it was a, there was a um, time period that, that was required that was advertised, there was an advisory committee, and that was made up of city council representative, real estate and housing staff, representative from the mayor's office, members of the community at large, and a member of the continuum of care. This year, we actually had a formerly homeless individual and a veteran that was added to the committee. Those folks went through the applications. Uh, as you can see in the in the following in the following sh um, slides in the slide deck, uh, there was requests that far exceeded dollars available. So there you go. As far as uh, we're looking at uh, seven hundred ninety-four thousand dollars were requested, and we had about two hundred thirty-two thousand uh, dollars to actually distribute uh, these. Uh, organizations, project title, the amount requested, and the funding recommendation and the source you see in front of you. Uh, that is, This is also scheduled to go through a public hearing process, a public hearing, and also a public comment process. Uh, so as far as this still has the ability to have some modifications, uh, when we talk about the, again, the goal of the, of the department is to be a conduit for these dollars to organizations in the community that can get these services and supplies to the most needy citizens of the city of Wilmington as quickly and efficiently as possible. You want to go through the rest of these charts, Mr. Weir? Sure. I mean, as far as... Uh, the idea that, again, once again, as far as each of these funding sources, if you look at uh, what was requested versus what was available, uh, we are, our requests far outstripped our actual resources. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the amount for HOPWA was close to a million dollars, and we had about $700,000 that we could make available to these organizations. In the previous slide, I think the number was ratio about the same. Um, so there's 372 in emergency shelter grant, and there's 173,000 that was recommended from the, by the panel uh, for these various organizations. Now, when we look at that uh, care money, uh, certainly that might be an answer to some of these uh, funding recommendations and the shortfall. But again, we have to make sure that we have the federal regs squared away, and then the community input, uh, along with uh, you know just being as clever as we can with it, because the resources. Uh, are still not enough for the uh, demand in the community. All right, at this point, I'll, I'll uh, take questions uh, from council members just for question number eight. Uh, I believe I see uh, council member Harley's hand. 
Let's move Harley. Uh, can you hear me? I can yes. hear you now. Did you have a question for Mr. Weir? Hello, can you hear me, Councilman Frio? I can hear you now, yes. Okay, I'm not sure if my question is number eight or not, but um, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Weir, when did they start uh, reaching out to these different communities? I, I think it's a great idea. I'm happy to hear that we are um, doing something and we are doing it in a collaborative matter, but when did all this start? And I'm only asking, so... I can be informed as to what's going on because this is my first time hearing all of this and I'm happy to hear about it, but did y'all start this a week ago, two weeks ago? And how did people know who needed to come to the table? Well, as far as Councilwoman, the process that started with the budget a year, uh, that started in December. So we had sent out notifications to uh, all the agencies that were currently getting money, any agency that had previously applied and maybe not had been funded. Uh, so we started that process really at the, at the, at the turn of the calendar year. Uh, the committee met uh, in February and March. So as far as when we talk about this process, this is a yearly process that uh, takes about four months when we talk about start to finish. Oh, okay. So basically these are organizations that you had already started working with and identified those organizations as the best, I guess, conduits to get the 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 other, the mask and the COVID items out to the community? Yes, well, we, we uh, certainly talked to the folks that we're already dealing with, but then we advertise separately so that, uh, that you know, say for instance, uh, with social media and with folks throughout the year that we might... Uh, to have conversations with, uh, they get put onto a list also. So we really try to be as comprehensive as we can to make sure that the availability of these funds, is, and that's also part of what federal uh, requirements are, so that we do the best we can to make sure that everyone that is uh, interested in these funds knows what the deadlines are, knows what the applications are. We actually had a meeting that uh, was before any of the applications started, and did a uh, technical capacity uh, building with the folks that were interested. So um, we, yes, we deal with the folks uh, on, that we deal with on a yearly basis, but that's not that's not a limiter for us. We are always looking for uh, new organizations to get involved. Understood. And lastly, I think I heard you say that you 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 basically have more demand than you have money. <laughs> yes. Uh, Absolutely. As far as, you know, there's some discussion, of course, as, as far as the efficiencies and things like that. Uh, but yes, it's pretty much of a standard operating uh, condition that the demands or the, the applications that come in are always greater than the dollars that are available. Understood. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Councilmember Dixon. Um, yes, thank you, Councilman Frail. Um, I have a few um, questions. So uh, one would be, um, how many new organizations have applied for um, the funding that's available um, out of the organization that um, routinely apply each year? Um, and then my second question would be, um, how much of that funding for each one of those lines have been expended thus far? Um, and then my third would be, um, how are we determining um, the distribution amounts? Like we said, HUD is changing on a regular basis as far as the amounts um, and for care. Um, but I'm just wondering how we're going to um, actively think about organizations that may not be traditionally on the list um, who may be providing services during COVID um, that could use those um, and what the plan is in order to execute that. I think I'll take the easy one first as far as how much money uh, that was awarded in previous years is spent. And generally speaking, uh, that has been a high percentage. We are also increasing our outreach to the agencies that currently are under contract, keeping them uh, big time as far as uh, on, on, on task to um, 
spend that money to make sure that they are spending that money. When we talk about the new folks versus the, uh, we've had two uh, new agencies that are being recommended for funding this year. Uh, the ballast of these uh, re agencies and projects uh, have been funded in previous years uh, so that there is a door open and we found at least two organizations that uh, we're recommending for funding this year. Um, did, I, did I capture that at all? Um, and then what's the, uh, what's the, if I can get the actual amounts, that would be great as far as like where we are in each one of those lines. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's, I'm sorry. I thought that uh, you might have the uh, PowerPoint already, um, but that certainly can get you that PowerPoint. You know, I'm looking at the two agencies that um, were new this year, uh, the Teen Warehouse and the Urban Bike Project were the two agencies that uh, are funded this year that were not funded last year. Okay. And then uh, the the last question was, how are we determining the um, and what's the plan for expending uh, the COVID care funds? The care um, funds? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, we have to make sure that uh, we know the limitations and what we can and can't spend it on. Uh, we have a working group here in the city that is represented by uh, finance, law, real estate and housing, uh, so that uh, we're looking to put that as far as the course before the cart. And then I believe what the plan is out of the mayor's office is to actually uh, look for community feedback, very similar to what we're doing uh, with the regular federal funds on a yearly basis, but I think that the urgency is a little bit um, higher given that the demand and the change in the environment is, is so radical. But there are there are a number of, of cities that are struggling uh, with getting, getting uh, the exact same answers that we're looking for uh, so that, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that we're uh, behind the curve there. Uh, in fact, we have a, a HUD Consultant, and I think we're probably a little bit ahead of the curve, to be honest with you. Uh, the fact that they announced the money doesn't mean that they're going to create a check yet. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, Council President Shabazz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Director Ware, I just want to make sure that I, I got a little confused there one minute in listening to some of the questions that um, was asked, and I just want to make sure I was clear in my understanding. So the allocations that you're demonstrating for the for uh, um, question number eight and their request the distribution, that's from the regular CDBG dollars that we get normally. That's not the COVID-19 dollars, because that's just been told that we have it. We don't have it in hand, and nor have we done any type of determination where we're going to distribute it. Am I correct? Absolutely correct, President Shabazz. So those persons... Um, that were there are just following our typical process that we've always followed in requesting for those types of dollars. Am I right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I, I just, just uh, clarity for my for my understanding. Um, and so, um, so we we will be looking to provide resources to those who are doing COVID based initiatives per the federal regulations in our division delegation of that monies of the COVID dollars that we get. That would be an open reach, far reaching process and with great input from the community, correct? Correct. Thank you for getting that clarification for me, sir. Yeah, we, it, the, two, the two funding sources, uh, they're the same names, but they are absolutely uh, different focused. Thank you, sir. Focused funds. Council Member Oliver. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, no, um, I think uh, Council President said it all. I, I was under the interpretation when he st when um, uh, Mr. Weir started off. It seemed as if this was something new, and I was saying to myself, "This is this been an ongoing process." Um, I've seen these some of these names before in the past who have applied for this um, this type of funding. Uh, it's just that times are hard, and I see uh, some new names. Oh, I know times are hard because some of these uh, uh, some of these businesses or companies would never even apply for the city of Wilmington. It just lets you know how things are tight across the board to see so many people putting a request that never put in a request before because we're not a um, 
human services uh, organizations, even though we do give out some funding. But to look at this, lo this large list, it seems if it, that we are in the uh, human service field. And I know we're not, but I mean, I just wanted to um, uh, make that clear that looking at some of these names, I'm like, wow, um, some of these people used to just fund themselves. They never even had to come out the door to even ask for money. But things are just tight across the board. But I know this has been an ongoing process. So that's, I was, I'm was. i basically reiterating uh, what the president said. I know this is normal for some organizations besides maybe a few of them, but just to look at that long list. So um, I was just gonna ask, say, I was gonna really just ask the question, state that I knew this wasn't a new process. That's all, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. all right, thank you. Council Member Harley. the question but I guess at this point since there has been clarification where can we council members be updated on what is going on I just like to know what's going on so when questions are asked from the community um, about these things I can be informed so I guess uh, Mr. Weir you know how can the council members be updated on the progress in terms of um, any updates as it relates to this COVID topic? Well, I, I'll commit. I'll commit that uh, out of this office, we will uh, once there is a uh, clarity on the federal regulations and what we can uh, invest in. Uh, that that would be a first key for me to send it out to city council as far as in a summary, uh, and then as far as through the mayor's office and through the working group. I'm sure that we'll be able to uh, up that uh, communication uh, highway so that we're all we're all aware of what's happening. Perfect. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Councilmember McCoy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Ware, I actually um, just had the two questions. So my question was basically, uh, you had spoke of the working group that you're, that, you know, that you're collaborating with. Wanted to find out, is there a name for the working group or am I uh, to assume it's this newly reconfigured WCAC? Like who is the working group? Well, there's, there's a representative from the mayor's office, there's a representative from city council. There is a representative, uh, as I say, from uh, uh, OMB and uh, real estate and housing department because we have been working with uh, HUD on, our, on a yearly basis uh, has been trying to be as helpful as possible. Okay, so so that is just no name, it's just basically the people from the different departments who are actually uh, trying to get this information uh, processed. Okay, um, the other question I had was uh, about the CARES Act funds. And I am very familiar about how this thing works when it comes to the CDBG dollars. Wanted to find out whether or not a lot of these agencies who've actually already applied and received funding, will they be able to reapply if they're actually doing things with the COVID-19? Absolutely, yes. As far as uh, I think uh, nationwide, what they're seeing is that uh, oftentimes the communities, the folks that have the infrastructure already uh, mm -hmm. are the most effective and efficient to delivering uh, organizations to the, to the uh, you know, and to, to the comment that was made earlier, um, an agency talked to me the other day and they said there was a 900 increase, a 900 percent increase in uh, requests for food uh, out of their agency. Well, they had previously been funded through the state for the most part. Um, but uh, so they now are, are scrambling to try to meet that need. And, you know, again, I, as was said earlier, the city itself, uh, we are participants. We, we don't really have enough money to be leader, leaders in a lot of these ways, but certainly uh, a couple million dollars out of the care funds can can uh, help a lot of citizens in the city of Wilmington. Okay. All right, uh, thank you. That's it, Mr. Warren. Okay. Um, what we're going to do now is jump back up to the top and, uh, and go to question number one. Discuss any proposed changes to positions, whether it's new positions, deleted, upgrades, etc. Mr. Chair, there are no additions or deletions of positions in the department. There have, uh, it was mentioned earlier that there were a number of findings that the uh, department had uh, suffered through as far as when we talk about uh, the federal funds and the admin cap. Uh, there are a lot of activities that this department undertakes that are not eligible activities. Uh, I think also when you talk about our vision and goals, when we talk about 
Uh, the housing market in general, uh, that's the easiest one to talk about because that is not income qualified. Uh, when you talk about uh, helping neighborhoods being stabilized, it's not always about uh, limiting income. So uh, when we talk about the positions and how one or two might have been moved, it was born out of a audit finding and we're trying to get that corrected. Uh, when we talk about the uh, budget transfers from the CDBG fund to the general fund, that, that really is what it's about. And I think it also uh, is uh, in support of a homeownership uh, initiative that we currently are not very robust in. Uh, we believe that even with the external events right now, uh, once we return to normal, uh, there is a pent-up demand for housing. There'll be a pent-up demand for home buyers. Uh, and I think that uh, the city of Wilmington will, it will be positioned well to uh, take advantage of that. Uh, when we look at the $111,000 that's been charged back to the general fund, that's pretty much of an average when I look back at the last four years uh, of what we've been overrunning. So, you know, although it's an acknowledgement uh, and a correction, I don't think it's an increase. Do you have a mechanism in place now so that that kind of finding doesn't continue in, in, in the future? Yes, we, uh, we have our own um, in-house uh, reconciliation process. Uh, you know, there was a time the real estate and housing uh, was, had a couple vacant uh, positions, and that really did not help us uh, moving, for, moving forward to have a um, very orderly and accurate. Uh, everybody in this department now keeps their time down to the hour. Uh, we had that reported and reconciled on a regular basis uh, so that, uh, you know, it's not a reconciliation six or eight months uh, down the road. It's a reconciliation within 30 days of the close of that month's books. So it's, we're trying to operate like a, a normal business would. Um, discuss the proposed $1 million allocated for grant funds to the Wilmington Neighborhood Conservancy Land Bank. And there's a couple of, uh, a couple of additional questions to this one. Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, part of the post-COVID-19 budget is that uh, we're now uh, asking for that to be reduced, believe it or not, to $550,000. Uh, when we look at uh, the Memorandum of Understanding that was signed in 17, 2017, uh, that, or actually 2016, I'm sorry, uh, that committed the city to supporting the land bank at, at the tone of $15 million over 10 years. Uh, there was only 1.5 uh, given to the land bank uh, in July 2017. Uh, when we look at, there has been a million dollars being requested from the state bond bill for the, for the organization. Uh, but when we look at it, we're really transitioning from what the land bank should be to what it, what, what it is to what it should be. Uh, and as far as when I talk to the land bank staff, what's the common belief right now is that uh, the operations, which is basically about $180,000 a year, maintenance, which can run up to $1,000 a property, about three hundred k a year, and then, of course, emergency demolitions, which uh, this committee talked uh, with Commissioner Starkey about. Uh, we've done a 10-year study, and right now we're, we're believing that the average cost of a demolition is $50,000. So, you know, I know that uh, it was discussed if it's a two-story or three-story, but averaging out over 10 years, if you look at all the permits, it's 50,000 units. So um, you're, you're talking about the inventory that they have. Uh, there is certainly a need. Um, and what we're looking to do there is um, support the mission, which is basically stabilizing these neighborhoods because these vacant properties, uh, the, the dangerous properties are... are it's an unhealthy influence on, on our community and the people that live there. You say that we're reducing it from 1 million to 550,000 in this budget. Yes. In light of the shortfalls that were, that were forecasted. Okay. Uh, Council member Gray, did you have a question? Council member Gray. <clears throat> yes, I do have a question. Um, is this a cash grant or a property or a title grant or a combination? Uh, the law department has not drafted the document, but I would certainly recommend that it would be drawn down on a uh, receivables uh, on a uh, project basis. 
Uh, certainly, when you talk about their operations, they're estimating right now their operations need is about $180,000 a year. Uh, they too should be closing out their books within 30 days of the uh, close of the month, and and requesting those those funds from the city would be my uh, recommendation. Um, I don't know if that answered my question of how are we giving it to Wilmington Health. I'm sorry, sorry to uh, the land bank. Is it going to be a cash grant, property, or title grant? The fact that they need the money that wasn't really what I understand. They need money. My understanding was it was. The original million was going to be a cash grant. Yes. So I presume that now it's only 550,000, that will also be a cash grant? That would be my assumption, yes. Okay, thank you. And I have one more question, please. Um, who, has, um, who has the authority now to uh, administer the land bank? The board. And what? who is the board? Uh, the board is is uh, represented uh, by a number of individuals. I don't. I, I would. I would not like to go down that list because I don't have it right in front of me. It was set up through the state's uh, enabling legislation. Uh, who would be represented on the board? But there are state reps. There's city reps. There's community reps. Uh, I know that I I sit on the board. Uh, and I would be happy to get that list uh, of the board members to you. Thank you. Um, Chairman, could I follow up with questions? I have two more. On this issue? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now that the Wilmington Housing Partnership is a component of the city, real estate and housing, where is the budget presented in the 2021 budget for Wilmington Housing Partnership? And the reason I'm asking that is because in the audit, Wilmington Housing Partnership agreed to um, conform to certain things that the auditors had requested, and one was to hire an accountant. So I don't see those funds in the budget, or where are they? Well, they haven't been approved by the board yet. The uh, 2021 budget has not been approved by the board, but it is in, uh, in place. And yes, they did hire an accountant. And where are those funds coming from? Well, they had been liquidating uh, some of their scattered site properties, uh, and that has been ge generally the source of their the only source of their revenue. Okay, uh, thank you, and you will forward to me the um, members of the board. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That's all I have, Chair. Councilmember Adams. Yes, thank you, Chairman Friel. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Ware, nice to see you. Thank you for uh, uh, appearing here before us uh, at the budget hearing. Um, I was going to ask about land bank, but let me uh, speak to the Wilmington Housing Partnership first. Um, my understanding that uh, the remaining properties, as you said, the uh, scattered properties are going to be transferred to the land bank and the Wilmington Housing Partnership dissolved. Is that, is that the plan? Well, I, I believe the plan is that the city will have no further involvement with the housing partnership, but will work with the board to assist in dissolving the agency as soon as it's practical. Uh, say, for instance, you know, they still have a couple uh, affordable housing homeownership projects that are in place. Uh, and that has contractors that are owed and so forth and so on. There are some details to properties that have mortgages uh, that they need to be sold and those mortgages need to be satisfied. So there are still some outstanding issues, but I think at the, in the long term, we're, we're looking forward to working with the land bank to determine the best use of the remaining housing partnership assets. Uh, what's the time frame for that dissolution? I would have to say right now without uh, delving too deep into it when it's practical. Uh, right now, there is no staff. Uh, we are looking to sell, our, we're actually looking to settle on our first home over at uh, Waltz Way uh, on Friday. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the future brings, but that particular project is one that uh, with those four homes sold, they're about 95% uh, complete right this very second. Um, by the way, if anyone knows of someone looking for a home, there are excellent products at 155. Uh, but uh, say, for instance, you know, that, that, that the uh, closing of those three additional properties will have a lot to do with it. There's a property that uh, we have um, that's a commercial property, and there's a purchaser that is um, has an 
hasn't made a physical offer, but it's talked it through, that closes, that that uh, moves the process along to basically, again, um, dissolve the dissolve the agency uh, as, as soon as it's practical. I don't, I don't, I don't want to get, I don't want to get into a major discussion about the partnership right now, because I don't believe there's money in the fiscal year 21 budget for it. Uh, no. If there are a lot of questions, I would suggest that uh, uh, Council Member Dixon might add it to one of her agendas in the very near future. Uh, okay, Mr. Phil, I'll take that. Um, with the understanding that if they're now a consolidated entity, that means they are part of the budget. So any sales of the home and wind down, and that would be. Uh, considered uh, part of consideration overall budget. I just want to see us get out of the business as quickly as possible. And, uh, you know, to say that there's no money in the budget to me, that just, uh, I don't, I can't believe that's an accurate statement. But okay, uh, uh, let, let's move on to the land bank. Uh, you, know, you know, as you know, from our discussions, I agree with you 100% that we should dissolve this, uh, this agency as soon as possible. Yeah, uh, hey, and, and I'm glad we're on the same page on that, but there are expenses that will be incurred between now and uh, as the politically corrupt politician, Mr. Ware says, as practical as possible. Uh, you know, we've had some government programs that have been winding down practically as possible for, uh, you yeah. know, four score and seven years. Understood. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a land bank, okay? <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Do you have a question about the land bank? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions with regard to land bank. Okay. Um, hey, um, I realize we made a commitment of a million five a year, okay, for a 10 year period, and we uh, only funded it, according to Mr. Wer, in 2017. Uh, are those 1.5? What about those two or three years of funding? Or have they been bypassed and we don't owe that money? Or uh, that money's forgiven? Or is it tacked on the end? Or uh, what are we doing with that four and a half million? Well, I would, I, would, I would answer that by saying that current situation and current conditions uh, would demand that we be prudent in what we would contribute to uh, their meaningful mission. When we talk about the years that were missed, I think that's probably up for discussion. Uh, you know, part of the issue is that there are a number of funders that are looking uh, to make contributions. And there's been discussion that, you know, if it's a city uh, initiative and the city's not contributing, then that doesn't give them a lot of confidence. So part of this is an initiative to get back on track and to also build confidence in some of the other contributors that this is a meaningful activity for the city. Okay, now uh, you said that we're specifically asking for a million dollars in the state bond bill. So is that a million in the state bond bill and a million in the city budget for a total of two million? Or is that only one million dollars coming from the state bond bill on behalf of the city? Well, the, the request in the bond bill is exactly that a request. Um, from my understanding, the $550,000 that the original $1 million has been reduced to is in the budget for this, from the city's uh, general fund. Okay, so if the state comes through for them, uh, the land bank's getting 1.55 this year, not just one or not just 550 is what you're saying. Mr. Adams, the original plan was the mayor proposed $1 million in his budget, and there would be a, another $1 million in the state bond bill. So a total of two million for, for fiscal year 2021. Yeah, and, and that's my concern right there. Okay, was it the didn't the state already make its contributions and what it had originally committed to land bank? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of either, Councilman. Yeah. I think that I think that to date the, the state uh, has uh, contributed a, approximately a million dollars. And there's been approximately 1.5 from other philanthropic sources to date contributed. Now, when you think about it, they have right now a conservative estimate of 23 properties that need to be demolished in their inventory uh, and at 50,000 a, a lot. I mean, you know, we talk about, again, what the need is versus what the uh, resources are. We're still, we're still short as far as um, actual demand on the street. Uh 
I, I, I hear you, Mr. Ware, but my, my question pertains to, uh, didn't the state originally commit $2 million up front and make that contribution? Again, from, from my uh, records, uh, I believe the state has contributed contributed $1,066,000 to date. Now, they have the land bank has made application and been successful going through the Strong Neighborhoods found, uh, uh, grant process through DSHA. I would argue that that's not the same as commitment from the state to support the organization, but they have received other funds from the from the state. I'm not uh, I don't have that total uh, right in front of me, though. Yeah, and my concern is is that uh, you know we're putting a million dollar ask in a state bond bill for a land bank where that we're already behind in paying ourselves, and are we really pushing out other uh, priorities in that state bond bill in order to uh, get the million dollars for the land bank in it this year? And so certainly, uh, if we're required to pay a million dollars a year to the land bank, that's really our commitment, and we shouldn't push out somebody else's million dollars to get our commitment of prior years in this year's state bond bill. So that that's sort of a point of contention, I'm sure, to have with that uh, state bond bill ask, because I really think it's a commitment in the city, and we're taking a million dollars away from someplace else to put it into the land bank. Uh, the, the, the request to the state for a million dollars wasn't to replace uh, any commitments the city had. And in fact, you know, our budgetary restraints, we were trying to put a million up this year to show the state and other contributors that we were serious about this. So the goal was, before we got hit with this crisis, was mm -hmm. over the next several years that the city would be putting up a million, the state would be putting up a million a year. Because as you know, uh, from the amount of vacant properties we have in the city, uh, two million dollars isn't going to go far to really address this issue. That there has to be a longer-term contribution made. So, uh, but this, but the million dollars, the bond bill wasn't to replace any city commitment. It was supposed to be uh, two commitments there: one from the city, one from the state. And we were hoping to get two million dollars this year. Well, thank you, Mr. Perry. You answered my question, uh, 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 Mr. Ware. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you, Councilmember Dixon. Councilmember Dixon. Um, yes, thank you, Councilman Friel. Um, again, I think I maybe have I may have three in one question. Um, so, uh, Director Ware, so um, how many houses uh, do we currently have in stock um, under real estate and housing? Um, then my next question would be, um, how many of our houses have been um, disposed of to the land bank? And then my last question is. Um, Actually, just those two for now. Uh, as far as we have transferred 92 properties to the land bank uh, to date, uh, currently, and I say 92 properties, generally speaking, they are structures. Uh, right now, the real estate and housing department has approximately 67 structures and close to 50 lots. One, one of the things that was discussed at... Um, the L and I hearing was the demolitions to private properties, and I'm not sure the commissioner said this, but you know the process is that the folks that can't pay for their properties that were demoed, then it goes to sheriff sale. The sheriff sale process then brings those into the inventory of the city, and the city then passes them through to the land bank. So you know that's that, that's the process for folks that have a property that's demoed but don't pay for it. And, and then um, just a, a, a follow up to that. Um, so do we, and I guess this may be in the amount of money that we give to um, the land bank, but does um, some of those funds, I guess, cover dealing with our properties too? Well, they haven't in the past, as far as uh, we've been working uh, as closely as we can uh, since I've been in, in this office. Uh, of trying to be, again, clever as possible. Uh, An example of that is that uh, we are negotiating with the land bank right now to do grass cutting and trash pickup. Uh, they have a contract with a property management group that they uh, are short on their inventory. They're, they they uh, have offered that they would cut grass for us for uh, a couple of months so that they could um, maximize their contract and minimize our uh, 
costs that would allow us then to deal with some of the properties that need to be demolished and so forth and so on. So, you know, it's, um, it's a big puzzle. And what we're trying to do is work together and with the land bank to make sure that we're being as effective and efficient in the neighborhoods as possible. Oh, thank you. That's fine. Uh, let's move on to question number three, discuss the available fund balance and the housing opportunity fund. Chair, Mr. Chairman, there are no funds. Uh, there's no fund balance in the housing opportunity fund right now, and there's no plans to replenish it that I know of. Discuss the 400000 proposed budget for the neighborhood clean team initiative. And there's two parts of that question. Well, uh, to date, the program's expended uh, $271,000. Uh, the balance of those funds are earmarked for the remainder of this fiscal year. Uh, when we talk about uh, their job, uh, they are weekly. Uh, the, the organizations that are participating in the program submit summaries of their activities to the project manager, who in turn reports to the department. Uh, the project manager makes daily inspections. We believe that uh, the trash count that we measure by bags picked up uh, is very effective in our neighborhoods. The folks that are being hired are being hired uh, from the neighborhood. The organizations that uh, are leading that those work crews are the, um, again, community groups. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all very tightly monitored with uh, regular reporting. Uh, and I think that if uh, on the soft side, if you go out to the neighborhoods that are working, you see a difference. Right. Um, discuss the 85,000 budget proposed for the Live Where You Work program. And there's a couple parts to that question. Yeah, uh, this is a really success story, I believe, because this uh, is dollars that have been approved by city council uh, to help city employees buy homes. Um, so what, uh, 33 city employees have participated in the program. Uh, when you look at the breakdown on this particular slide, it's uh, very diverse as far as the departments that are taking advantage of it. Uh, what we do out of the real estate and housing department is that we, one, have a representative giving an overview of the program to every new employee uh, um, orientation program. Uh, that person is also... Uh, available to help with the softer questions of how do I do this? How do I do this? How do I do this? We uh, require homeownership counseling for these folks before they get uh, involved in the program. And once again, I think it's a, it's a real success story. Uh, and I, I think that uh, we probably could in, enjoy some more funding and, and get it out uh, to, to the employees. I think that it still doesn't necessarily meet the demand. Um, discuss the 83,000 in consultants pertaining to the department's home ownership initiatives that is now being charged in the general fund that was previously paid for by the CDBG fund. Well, part of it is the Live Near Your Work program. We're anticipating that we are going to be working with uh, the Delaware State Housing Authority uh, in a city centric program. That program does serve individuals above the HUD threshold, and we believe that's important to stabilize our neighborhoods, that uh, we are looking at home buyers that are not limited to 80% median family income. So what we're looking at there is having a partnership with DSHA and also putting some federal funds in from our side so that we will have funds available for uh, lower income home buyers and for folks that go up to 120% median family income. Uh, once again, that needs to be, uh, there's a lot of cooperation. There's a lot of information that needs to be shared. There's a lot of marketing to that. Uh, one of the issues that I've identified is that, you know, there's very few market rate folks that are, if someone came in and said, hey, I, I'm looking for a house at $150,000, there's very few folks that uh, are in the real estate profession to say, hey, I, I, I'll take you in the city. So we, we anticipate this particular um, CDB, the formerly CDBG funded position to be out marketing to the realtors, being marketing to the housing counselors, to be coordinating between the two, two income stratus as far as the uh, program. And again, we think that we can, with uh, 
not a whole lot of dollars produce close to 100 home buyers in in the city and when you talk about that stabilization and you talk about that per unit cost that becomes a little more uh, efficient Councilmember Harley do you have a question Councilmember Harley uh yes can you hear me yes can you hear me okay um I'm not sure if this is relevant right at this moment but I was curious about uh, funding for the census, the 2020 census, did those funds go to your department, Mr. Weir? Um, no, Councilwoman, they, they did not. Okay, well then we can move on. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, discuss the plan use of 400,000 budgeted between the disposition miscellaneous project, account lines, and the rehab division pertaining to disposition of property management. And there's uh, two parts of that question. Well, some of the things we're looking at uh, that are very simple as far as the vacant property expenses, and, and that's crass cutting um, the list that you see in front of you as far as, um, you know, I think th there's not a lot of discussion. There's not a lot of discussion needed when you know that uh, in our neighborhoods, uh, vacant properties are magnets for, um, you know, dumping and all kinds of other uh, things as far as the, the actual property. The properties also that come in into our inventory uh, are telling us one way or the other that they don't have any market uh, value. So that's why we end up with them. Uh, so they generally are in bad shape. And that goes back to the cooperation between the land bank and the city. Uh, in some ways, when you talk about the contribution that the city's been making to the land bank, it might not have been a dollar uh, granted to them, but it had certainly been in a cooperative uh, nature where we would maybe, uh, if we'd say, for instance, we're de demolishing two buildings, one of them is theirs and one of them's ours, it made a lot more sense for us to actually take them both down. So, you know, when you talk about those budget lines, uh, we're also looking at um, currently to renovate a property in the city of Wilmington and sell it, you're looking at somewhere between $100,000 and $120,000 needed in subsidy. So what we're looking to do is we're looking, and, and part of that is because uh, yeah. we don't we don't have a lot of um, folks that are interested in work, a lot of construction resources that are interested in working in the city because they don't have the skills to go into a vacant property that's been vacant and deteriorating for 10 years and be able to bid on it successfully. So one of the things that we've been doing this year is that we've been doing interior property cleanouts, and that means taking it down to the studs and we've also been putting a roof on those properties so that they don't deteriorate the properties that are on either side. And we're hoping and we're seeing some um, progress that contractors that come into a building that have been stripped out and there's no surprises, that's more like bidding on, on new construction work versus going in and saying, I don't know what's behind that wall. I don't know what the condition of that is. Uh, and I'm going to try to bid on it. Uh, we think that part of the, those dollars is to move towards a, a building that is more appealing to not only the construction resources, but also it's going to save us money in the long run. Uh, and also uh, when we have these properties, they're not going to be leaking and deteriorating into the properties next door. Uh, because, you know, if you talk to anybody that lives next to a vacant property, I mean, it's between the water infiltration, the um, animals, uh, the, you know, the behaviors that it attracts, uh, like the dumping and things like that. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put a system together that we're using the money as, as cleverly as possible and making it more really appealing for someone to come in and look at it and say, geez, I can see exactly what's going on there. And that's going to be a big initiative for us uh, because this year we did it a couple times. A perfect example is that there's a property on 6th Street that it was going to cost us 50000 to demo, and we ended up putting a new front on it, a new roof, and stripping it all out for about thirty. And what we have now is we have a property that is not a toothy neighborhood. We didn't destroy uh, a property in the middle of the block. Now we have a, a shell that there are people that are interested in going in there and, and renovating. And I, I think that's the key. To, you know, we have to market ourselves in every way we can when we talk about uh, neighborhood stabilization. Um, question number eight, we already covered. That was the CDBG question. Question number nine, like other departments, um, is uh, he provided a, a organizational chart and some descriptions of some of his uh, positions. Council members can look at that at their leisure. Um, I can't see what it is. 
Uh, Councilmember Dixon, did you have a question before we go to public comment? Um, yes, really quickly. I just wanted to know, Director Ware, are we getting um, better feedback on um, our properties? I know people have brought up that our properties are not um, as secure and, and um, not taken care of in the same capacity. Have we been hearing a different um, story around our properties? I, bl I believe we have because we've been cooperating uh, with the land bank. Now, the land bank has a crew that is out on a daily basis. Uh, what we do as far as on the city side is that we basically have subcontractors that we call out on jobs. Now, that's a little more efficient as far as uh, dollars and cents because we're not paying for someone that's just driving around and, and uh, we have, don't have that much control. But the combination of the two, I think, has actually done, uh, done a service to the community. Uh, from my perspective, one of the issues is that if you have a property that's been in your neighborhood for 10 or 15 years and no one's ever answered when you complained about it other than Ellen and I coming out and citing them, and then suddenly it, it goes into an ownership that you can call someone up, it seems to me that a lot of times that pent-up frustration that, hey, it's been vacant and, and uh, not taken care of for 10 years, but now I know I can call somebody up and they'll answer the phone drives more calls to us. But uh, we've been working on it, and, and I believe we've had less. Uh, and we're also working in cooperation with L&I, so we have a lot more eyes on the street than we've uh, had previously. And I think that the complaints have actually gone down. They're not going to go away. Um, I mean, you know, over the last couple of weeks, we've had a, a serious increase. And I, Commissioner Starkey talked about a, a serious increase in trees being blown down by the, by the weather. And, you know, again, you show me a abandoned uh, building, and I'll show you a bad tree. They go hand in hand. So, you know, a lot of these properties that we have, um, you know, they have the trees that are, you know, trash trees that are in bad shape and we get a hold of them and the luck is that the, the uh, wind blows them over. Well, now that person next door knows exactly who to call because it's either the city or the land bank and they know we'll be responsive. Okay. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and open it up for any public comment. Or anyone who has been uh, participating that would like to make comment on the Department of Real Estate and Housing's uh, fiscal year 2021 budget. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. Um, Mr. Weir, thank you for uh, for joining us today and answering all our questions. We appreciate it. There were a couple things that you're going to uh, work with Marshall to get answers uh, for, for council members. Absolutely. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and just announce some of the upcoming budget hearings. Uh, we're back here this Wednesday night, April 22nd. Uh, we will hear first from the Mayor's Office of Economic Development, followed by the Department of Parks and Recreation. And then the next night, Thursday, April 23rd, we will hear first from the Audit Department, followed by Human Resource Department, followed by the Law Department. And both those nights start at four o'clock. Uh, one week from tonight, April 27th, uh, we will hear from the Finance Department and the Office of Information Technology. I want to thank again my colleagues for, uh, for, for participating tonight and for asking your questions. And this concludes this meeting in Wilmington City Council's Finance and Economic Development Committee. Thank you all. Thank you, Council Mayor Friel. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor.